They wanted to arrange a workshop, or they wanted to arrange training, but they didn't have access to, to a little bit of pocket money to pay for teas and coffees or the room, or some, people, some institutions use that to print materials or to print guides to mentoring once they're getting their programs going. And then recently we've had a series of peer-led case study visits where one institution has gone to another and looked at how things are working and are writing a report up and out about some of the, su the successes they've seen. And those are coming. And there's some good practice guides which are also coming along the way. Just as a few numbers about what's changed. Um, so in just in, in 2015, there were only six of the 31 institutions in that institutional strengthening program that had policies or strategies to support their professional development. Last year, there were 19. And in terms of mentoring, five in 2015 had mentoring schemes. Now it's up to 17. And, and the other institutions are, on, are coming along along the way as well. And just, just before I move on, um, if I have time, I just want to share one little, little anecdote um, from one of those champions workshops where we brought everyone together. And somebody from, well, the director of the DVC research from Michael Okpara University in Nigeria, we invited her to give a presentation about some of the things they've been doing at, at, at her institution. And she talked about them, had the mentoring scheme. She talked about the, the new um, induction program that they'd instituted for all new research staff joining the university. She talked about, she showed pictures of the workshops they'd run with every dean and every head of department going through that, that induction program because the vice chancellor thought, well, if, if the new staff are going to get this, then, then certainly the old staff need to know it as well. Um, and at the, end of, at the end of her presentation, which was, which was fantastic, I overheard two of the other delegates talking. One, one was from Ibadan and the other was from McCarray. And I, I can't quote this verbatim because, um, anyway, in slightly more flamboyant language, the, the person from Ibadan turned to his colleague from Macaria and said some, something to the effect of, goodness gracious me, um, we are streets behind. <laughs> when I get home, I better pull my socks up. And the... And the the gentleman from Macquarie replied and said, you and me both, brother. I mean, that was fantastic. I mean, hats off to them. That was inspirational. Um, so for me personally, I mean, that, that, that for me epitomizes a lot of what the ACU is about and why I, why I love working there so much. Because if, if Ibarden and Macquarie can draw inspiration from my clock para, then I figure we've got to be doing something right. So the other half of the program was the, the fellowships. Um, I said 100, 100 one-year fellowships, 61 postdocs, 39, 39 postmasters. 51 of those fellowships went to women. Um, that, was, that, was a, that was a log frame target from DFID, but it was, it was quite tough to meet, and we met it without any drop in academic quality. And there was a range of interdisciplinary topics covered. And each of those fellows had three points of support, and I think this worked really quite well. So they had a mentor from their home institution, and their mentor mentored them through the process of putting their application together, because it, it was still competitive. Then when they got to the, when they went out on fellowship, um, they had a supervisor in their host who supervised their research for a year. And then we also lined them up with a specialist advisor who was a world-leading expert in the area of their research. And they were from a range of, many were from the UK, but we had specialist advisors in India, in Sweden, in Egypt, wherever the person was who had the, the, the expertise. And they, again, provided input on the research design. They provided suggestions on routes to publication, and they, they, they looked through sort of draft manuscripts when they were getting ready for publication. And we organized a pre-fellowship pre workshop and a post-fellowship workshop for, for the fellows where we talked them through how to, how to manage their own professional development, how to take control of their own careers. Um, in terms of funding, they had an accommodation allowance, a stipend, a research grant. Um, they had a fund to go out and attend conferences to, to apply and pay for training. And some of them did some amazing things like with that. There was one of the, the Ghanaian fellows who had $2,000 
But in the space of the year, he went to the US twice, he went to Australia, he went to India, he went to so many different places because he, he would leverage that little bit of funding and, the, and ask the conference organizers, I've got this little bit of money, what can you give me? And he went all over the world. Then at, we also provided a publication support fund and a research uptake fund which the, which the fellows have used to engage with communities, to engage with policymakers, to help translate their research into, into impact. And just because I like seeing the faces, these are, these are the fellows who came here to South Africa. And, and Adam, you'll be happy to know, they have all gone back to their home institutions. Um, all except for Portia, who is um, uh, the, the Ghanaian lady in the middle, who is now doing her PhD at UCT. In terms of numbers, um, that cohort of, of uh, there were 97 actually who finished the fellowship. They've had 399 accepted publications, which includes 330 already published. So there's more on the way. Those are the ones that have been published already. 330 published in peer review journals. From the 61 postdocs, three of them were subsequently invited to be IPCC lead authors, which is awesome. 77% have presented at international conferences and 81% have been part of multidisciplinary teams applying for funding. So they're doing incredibly, incredibly well. Sure. Um, in terms of publication support, we, we help them through open access publishing. We help them be aware of predatory journals. As I say, their specialist advisors gave them advice on routes to publication. And the project paid their APCs, which going slightly off piece, but in, in in terms of the comment about equity, um, it's part of the part of the funding was was a requirement that they publish in open access journals because it, the funding came from from public purse. But looking at the cost of APCs, and I've been we were comparing them to academic salaries. So these are. We've compared the cost of an APC to the average cost of a lecturer salary in a number of different countries. And the one that really stands out is Nigeria. The, cost, the salary cost of a lecturer in Nigeria for three months is equivalent to the average cost of an APC. And if you look at Nature Communications, which is the most cited open access journal in the world, then it's nine months. So you, if, you're, if you're a Nigerian university, you can employ a lecturer for nine months, or you can pay for one publication in Nature Communications. So that's, I'm, it's not a, not a level playing field in my view. So it's, anyway, that, that was a digression. Um, very nearly done, Joanna. So in terms of, we, we run a counterfactual survey each year to look at how our, how our circle fellows are, are performing compared to some of their peers. So there's three colors in here. The, the dark blue are the, the circle fellows. The mid blue are, other, other researchers at those same institutions, and the yellow are researchers at non-circle institutions. And so the, we can see the, the circle fellows are submitting more publications. They're getting published a little bit more, but they're also publishing in higher quality journals. And I think that's what, this is a quite a key outcome, and they're, they're avoiding predatory journals and low-cost journals a lot better than their, their peers. And this, this last slide is a little bit confusing. Um, we looked at the gender split um, of, of those fellows who are lead authors in a prestigious journal. So among the circle cohort, 64% of the circle fellows who are lead author on, a, on an article published in a prestigious journal, 64% of them were women. And that compares to 55% of the sample there. So actually, the, the female circle fellows are actually doing better than their, their male peers. But then if we look at the, the yellow, which is the non-circle institutions, again, of the, of, the, of the academics who are a lead author in a prestigious journal, only 5% of them were women. And that's, I mean, it's not a true comparison because only 35% of that sample size were women. But it shows, it show, I think, shows the, the stark difference about how, the, how um, the gender split is doing, is doing among the Circle Fellows. That is my overview of the Circle program. So 
Associate Professor in the Department of Agricultural <coughs> Economics and Extension, former Circle Visiting Fellow under Cohort 1. For, fellow, for your fellowship in 2015, and his research interests focus on, focuses on environmental economics and food security. Uh, afternoon, colleagues. I'm given just a few minutes, so I'll run through most of the issues we had discussed by Ben. I was a beneficiary of SECO project, uh, Cohort 1, in 2015. Uh, I just want to share with you my experience and what has happened, and uh, you be the jury whether SECO really helped us or not. Uh, I'm uh, actually an associate professor, but when I joined SECO, I was just a junior lecturer, so you can start seeing some of the benefits that came through SECO. Um, my presentation is in three parts. The first part is background information, then did to touch much of it, so I won't spend much time on it. Then the second one is basically on the impact and concluding remarks. Basically from my home institution, I demand a, uh, a lady, Dr. Zhou. Uh, she's from geography, I'm from agriculture economics, but we blended very well. Basically she was offering social support to myself. I think Maria will do all much on mentorship. I don't want to preempt a discussion. But basically, she helped me a lot in understanding what is it in the academics and uh, how can I balance social life and academics because that's very important. We are human beings. We don't just rely on our workplaces. We also have families to look after. So she gave me a very supportive role. And one thing that also helped me from that angle was getting uh, what you call leave days, when you get such a funding to move from your institution, when you are very young and just joining the institution, you won't be having leave days or sabbatical days. This is, they normally sign these things, but operationally, HR will tell you, you don't have days and you can't go. So it was a role to negotiate with my HOD, negotiate with the uh, HR department so that I can go to UCT. When I arrived at uh, UCT, my worst supervisor was Professor Martin uh, Visa. She's from economics angle. At least we share something because I'm from agriculture economics. Her role was basically on technical support in terms of building the research and helping me to identify best publications um, journals and conferences to attend. I had also a technical advisor. It didn't work very well because of um, Skype challenges because most of the time I was in the field. So I won't talk much about it, but my other colleagues benefited a lot who were able to connect with the specialist supervisor. Before we started the program, we were loaded with a lot of uh, skills, we actually had a one week training in Nairobi, spearheaded by the African Academy of Sciences. They did coach us in several skills that were necessary to conduct a research, to also interact with peers and be in a position to get funding from other funding organizations to leverage our research. On arrival to our home institution, UCT also had a lot of programs to support uh, my research, and I'm very grateful to that effect. And a lot of other colleagues in our courts, they were given similar approaches wherever they went. Uh, post my fellowship, we also had an opportunity to go back, and we were lucky to meet with the second cohort that we are about to start their fellowship, and we shared a lot of experience with them, which was very interesting, and our practical challenges, and I think they benefited a lot. So ideally, this is how the program worked. I'll move straight into the impact that I can quickly pick from the project. Basically, my publication before I visited, uh, I, I joined the fellowship. I was targeting one, two, papers per year. 
Uh, for your background information, I got my master's in 2010, my PhD in 2012. So I was actually a researcher. But even with a PhD, I was struggling to publish, you can see, two papers per year. That was my maximum. When I got uh, the fellowship 2015, I just targeted two papers because that was the police. Uh, but I had a lot of papers that were ready for publication. 2016, my publication moved to three. 2017, five. 2018, eight papers. 2019, as of now, 10 papers have been accepted. And I can tell you more papers are there, but I'm just reserving them. Uh, in terms of uh, international conference, post my master's and PhD, I was visiting, I, I was able to present papers, one in Brazil, one in Italy, one paper per year. But post my fellowship, in 2015, during my fellowship, I actually presented three papers in China, Dubai, and Turkey. 2016, it dropped to Dubai and Singapore, mainly because of funding. Then 2017, USA, Japan, and Singapore, three papers. 2018, two papers. So you can see how my conference publication rose after the fellowship. In terms of uh, postgraduate supervision, uh, before the fellowship, basically I think I managed to graduate one master's student. That was in 2014. 2015, the number rose to two. 2016, two. 2017, three. 2018, we are talking of six. This coming May, I'm expecting six master's students to graduate. In terms of PhD, that was a hassle, but 2017 I had one, 2018 I have two, 2019 I'm expecting two. I'm also supervising a postdoc. Uh, I had one last year and I've got one this year. So you can see how my postgraduate supervision also improves because of this. Research grants, a lot has been talked about where is this money coming from? I think I've got the magic. Uh, before even joining Seco, uh, I'm my background is I'm coming from industry. From industry, if you don't bring money in the company, you fired yourself. I was actually from an NGO background. If you don't have funding, then you don't have work. Then I also had some time in government and private sector. So my research grant skills, they've been there, but they were made better by SECA. 2011, soon after my master's, I managed to bring 4.9 million to invest of 40 through research. 2012, after my PhD, half a million. This is in runs, not US dollars. Uh, 2013, 825,000. 2014, 100,000. Then during SECA fellowship, 3.1 million. 2016, 3 million. 2017, 6.3 million. 2018, I decided to put some breaks because I needed to manage the money that I have for me to produce quality. I'll share with you where money is. Don't look at NRF alone. There is a lot of funding in this world. Uh, impact on research uptake. With a background of industry, I don't believe in just publishing. I believe in taking research findings to resolve the problems of societies. Before I joined SECO Fellowship, much of my research uptake was on producing what we could call systematic knowledge generation without necessarily moving the research findings to affect the affected communities. But post my fellowship, I started now moving research from publications to institutions and societies that really benefited. I've got a lot of examples that I can talk of, but just a few. We networked with a lot of uh, farmers to move the technology that we find in lab so that they benefit the farmers. Um, from an agricultural point of view, we do a lot of genetics and improvement of seed varieties. 
We worked on a lot of BT maize that we partnered with farmers in the Eastern Cape province, which they are currently absorbing from that. We also networked with a lot of bee farmers where we trained them to use beekeeping as an adaptation strategy to climate change because even with higher temperatures, beekeeping sometimes can happen. So there are a lot of technology transfer that we've done within the communities through research. In terms of uh, collaboration, this is where my research fundings normally comes from. Uh, I've managed to connect Investor Fortier with Community Technology Development Organization in Zimbabwe. It's a local NGO. Our idea was to develop a mobile verifier detection and sharing system for Zimbabwe. We got a challenge from environmental management agents. They were saying, fires are happening in the country, but we can't see them. Then we sat down with the local NGOs that were leading in veiled fire research. Then we also got funding from them and say, how can we put our ideas together and try to solve environmental management agents to monitor veiled fires in the country? We got funding from NRF that say, okay, I see a small grant to collaborate. I used it very much to visit Zimbabwe and try to network with the organizations that were there. SECO also gave me 50,000 runs to upscale the project. Then what we are currently looking at, we have developed the prototype that works. You can see veiled fires within Zimbabwe context on your mobile phone. And we can send notifications to local communities where the fire is burning to alert them. What we are only looking for is funding to upscale it. We have triggered the institution in Zimbabwe through the government to release funding through their line ministries so that we can upscale the system. That's what we are waiting for. I have also networked with Namibia University of Science and Technology. Uh, this one, we were also trying to bring in the mobile hardware de detection system for Southern Africa. Now we realize that there is a lot of wildfires within Southern African countries. I got 50,000 from Investor Fortier, from NRF and NCRST, the same Nam Namibian funding organization. We got 1.2 split in two, 600,000 for South African, 600,000 uh, Namibian currents to develop a prototype that can detect veiled fires in South Africa and Namibia and possibly other Southern African countries. I also flew to Namibia. Okay. Um, the interesting part about the Namibia story is the colleague that I'm networking with, uh, Justin Yaga, we met during SECO fellowship. He was also hosted by University of Cape Town. So during lunch time, we would share challenges of societies. We realized that malaria is claiming a lot of death within Africa. In South Africa, you might not be aware, but if you come from Limpopo, I think you'll be very much aware. So we also developed a prototype of a web and mobile early warning malaria detection monitoring system for the two countries, uh, that's Kenya and South Africa. And currently we are looking for funding to up upscale it from those uh, organizations. The last one that I want to share with you is uh, the collaboration that I spearheaded with the uh, Department of Rural Development and Agrarian Reform, Dr. Da, in the Eastern Cape. Apparently, they came to the university and said, we don't have a database that you have got all the agricultural database for the Eastern Cape. It's scattered all over the province, and it's very difficult to coordinate and try to steer development when things are like that. Then we sat down with the GIS, computer science and agriculture economics team and say we can develop an online portal for you that puts everything on one system so that you can access and understand where your animals, your, your crops and your soils are. We got actually 3.1 million from Dr. Da and they've got a lot of funding that they get from treasury. So as researchers, we need to collaborate with implementing agencies. We need to know them. And I wonder if we don't collaborate with them, what's speaking to the modules that we teach our students? It's the industry that should dictate the direction where we should be teaching because we are teaching graduates who are supposed to graduate and become employees to those organizations. And they've got a lot of funding 
that they are throwing back without utilizing every year. The last impact is on my promotion. I finished my PhD in 2012. 2013, I did my postdoc. 2014, was employed as a lecturer, University of Forte. 2015, got the circle visiting fellowship. Uh, soon after coming back, I put my promotion. I was promoted to a senior lecturer position. Interestingly, but this is not for public consumption. HR did tell me that my points were equivalent to a full professor, but they can't award me because of the protocol I have to wait. Then I said, it's fine. After that, 2017, 2018, I put my application for associate professor. They awarded the associate professor and say, your points, they are also still above full professor. Just wait for one or two years and you get it. So I would just want to thank Seko in my concluding remarks that they changed my mindset. <laughs> they enhanced my publication, enhanced my career development, enhanced my research and community engagement. Funds permitting replication of a similar progr program targeting Southern African researchers. Why Southern African researchers? You can see from the beneficiary of cohort one, we were just a few guys from Southern Africa. I believe there is a gap that we should be targeting. To me, this is an intergenerational investment with multiple ripple effects in institutions and uh, the government would benefit in future. Thank you. Can you, is that better? She has successfully institutionalized the research development framework there um, and has been a really effective mentor for the program. Maria is passionate about rural community climate change vulnerability, resilience, and adaptive capacities, focusing on sustainable livelihoods approach and information technology for development. Thank you very much, Maria. I'm here to share with you how we did it or how we have made it. And thanks to SECO, my slides will be slightly different from what you have been seeing because I did that deliberately to show you how we lure students to come and want to learn more. And we also encourage even the supervisors and mentors to note that they don't know it all. They still have something to learn. Where do I get my inspiration from? I went through the conferences and the protocols and all the government interventions and government uh, agreements that dealt with climate change. And I realized that our country was one of the signatories to the conventions on, can, on climate change since 2015. And that, in that con convention, our universities, or un all universities, are expected to do something about climate change. You look at the climate change education for sustainable development, which also calls for action rather than just people looking at what is happening. So when, when CAT joined the CLIMB um, circle in 2014, I was asked to come a lead in, in mentoring, mainly because I was a, a research methods lecturer. That's what I thought. I met a group of vibrant young researchers. And if you look at the word the attitude, it's the only word so far that I know, which if you convert the, the letters to numbers, it adds up to 100. 
The only way that gets you to 100% is an attitude. So all about attitude. Change that attitude. You can have all wonderful programs within the universities. I will not talk much about that. You've heard from Ben and the previous speaker. That's an example of, again, a CVF who is doing wonders within our university. We learn from the mentorship program that if you want to do your program and, and make it successful, establish needs first. In the university, we use training evaluations just as we do evaluations of end of modules. So we do uh, program evaluations and we do direct interactions with the early career researchers. We ask them. Then from them, we develop training programs. So they are already needs driven. And then we ensure committed attendance. We ask them in the committee that they will come and attend. So we set aside a, a week that means two weeks in one year, where these early career researchers would then come and attend a full week of uh, upskilling. So we execute our training and we make sure that the training is interactive. During the training, we, we encourage mentors to participate. And when, when they are doing introductions, for example, a student will realize, oh, the, the professor is listening to me. Therefore, this program must be very interesting. Then we make sure that when you are doing my presentations, you don't you present alone or you don't take over the show. Make sure it's a team presentation so that everyone is involved. How do we create a sustainable ISP program of mentorship? We realize that it's not an easy task. You hear people saying, I organize a workshop and people don't end up. I try to do this and people are not cooperative. That's true. But you need to create buy-in right from the start, from the management. Work through the vice chancellor, the pro-vice chancellors, and they will help you. Make sure that the people will come and participate. I will not talk about collaboration. It has been already extensively explained. Mainstream ISP into the university curricula. Don't make the program your own or an isolated program within the university. Make it be felt that this is an interdisciplinary aspect. And every faculty therefore need to take into account the research development framework, how to do research, and there are issues of climate change, even in any area that you think you don't think about climate. So make sure they, they, they take part. So we use existing structures. We don't have to create new structures. We use the existing structures like we have got a postgraduate uh, directorate. We have got a center for uh, academy of teaching and learning, which we use because they already have and they embed our programs within their structures. Share your program activities. Don't think about a program and then you try to work it alone. You share it with other faculties. And if they can invite you and you invite them, then they, the university management and staff realize that this is an important program. And network, I will not talk about it. It has been extensively talked about. Make sure that when you are dealing with the program, you involve a number of people. For example, with, with the, our university, the one week I'm talk, talking about, every second day of the residential week is assigned to SECO. And each time we, de we decide on what to upskill our students on. This year, we were mainly concerned with mentorship. Last, is, last year, Last semester, we were talking about the research development framework. So on day one, the university is almost fully engaged, and they're looking at like library e-learning tools and resources, uh, referencing styles, data analysis, and presentation. 
Then on day two, we are doing our project. Make sure you become part of the implementation process. You don't just create buy-in. Be part of the whole process of implementation. So what we do is we encourage our members to also ensure that issues of climate change are incorporated even into the research policy. That alone will ensure, it will help you make sure that issues of climate impact are already embedded within the university. Our university with research policy, to which I am the deputy chair, managed to have the research theme number two, include climate change issues. So I'm happy and I know my program will be running through because we can't change the policy now. How do we ensure that the programs run successfully? Engage, don't be a loner. Work with others. Network, I will not go in. Fundraise, he has talked about it. Commit sincerely. When you work with the groups that you work with, work with them in your sincerity. It's not to, to make sure that you are seen or you, to be known that you are doing something. Work with your whole heart. And above all, try to make sure that you take control as a leader. Monitor and evaluate. Be a team member. Be a team builder and a team player. And therefore, become committed towards a common goal, where in our case is to enhance capacity. Encourage your ECRS to publish with other mentors. I will not go about talking about it, it's already been talked about. And manage diversity in terms of age, physical circumstances. Think about and manage their cultural background. Also manage their educational background because early career researchers are joining the university from everywhere. They want to come and do an MPhil, a PhD, but they are coming from other universities where the mode of learning may be very different. You need to manage that. And above all, try to work on gender ed ethnicity. We cannot, I, I will not elaborate on that. In the morning we heard a lot about gender equality. Get out of the comfort zone. Try to get out of the comfort zone and do something different which other people are not doing. And that way you can have your programs work out. Where is the payoff for this circle program? We do co-authoring. Right now we are almost through with our mentorship guide. And you, the program, the workshop we did last week was actually to try out, to see how popular our topics were with our students. I'll show you why, why we thought it was successful. Share your experiences as we have been done, as we have um, just had. In every workshop we have a CVF, we explain how they have benefited so that they, they understand it's not just a talk. Is something that is tangible. And try to work out programs that upskill the early career researchers. Keep members in touch. We, we always use interactive, interactive uh, uh, methods of making people work together and get to know information. Circle is a very vibrant base camp. You, you put in pictures, you put in evidence of what we have done, and all members in circle have, uh, have the opportunity to see what others at other universities are doing, learn from them, and they comment and help each other. Call for conference papers and grant applications. We also use these platforms to share that kind of information. Our major challenge at the moment is funding, but for sharing, last year when I shared our success, I had a challenge of how we can disseminate research findings. I shared the same concern at the university, and this year, starting this year, every fourth day of the residential week has been turned into a research day. And our early career researchers display their work and share where they are. 
they get a lot of help from other people. And actually, this has helped from our experience this year that mentors attend and supervisors attend. We in Zimbabwe have been given funding to introduce innovation hubs, but we still need funding to make the, the research outputs get out into the communities. So far, we can just put our output into the hub, but we don't have much money to get it out. In summary, what am I saying? If you want your program to run out, to, to, to come out well, always strive towards effective embedding of mentorship program and try by all means to become a leader. Be a leader, just be a leader. It would, things will work out. Also, communicate. Communicate everything and communicate effectively. Follow the university protocol. Don't try to go outside. Work with the university, work with the management. That way you'll, you will be assured that your mentorship and supervision become the gateways to achieving your university goals. Work in a team, I will not expand on that, and embrace multidisciplinary research. This was the last week mentorship workshop. Those two who are leaning on the walls are our CVF, who are now running mentorship workshops. We just mentor them to, to see what they are doing, and that those two are uh, reporting back on the kind of mentor they want to see. What, they, what, what came out of that is going to be the, the cover page of our mentorship book. We just turned everything into a word of. That was last year to, to my right, and that was last, this year, this year. And that team is a team of uh, supervisors and mentors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and we're now going to hear from Dr. Mabila from the University of Limpopo, who has been the research director and manager of STARS. And afterwards, I'm hoping we're going to have a little bit of a discussion because we have a lot of DVCs, PVCs, uh, VCs of research here. You've seen, I mean, I think we've heard testimony of programs that are now finished that have been really successful. We want to put in new generation programming. We want to talk to funders about what they should be. So having your input through this session today and tomorrow into what you think does work well, what would systemically change in your institution if you adopted, for example, some of the programs from Circle, indeed, if it's needed or not. So I'd quite like us to be able to have a more of a collective discussion after the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm not going to take long, I believe mainly because uh, I had to fill in some very big shoes. <clears throat> Just for me to reflect on our participation in the structured training for African researchers, which was uh, a program of the ACU that we participated in as the investor of Limpopo I think it's two years or so ago. I think it's a, a little bit uh, more than two years. Uh, at the time, I was uh, working as the research developer in the university, and then I was tasked to coordinate the participation and uh, setting up, uh, putting together the cohort that was going to be part of this program. Uh, in universities like where I work, you find that the main challenge becomes even when you recruit people to participate in programs that uh, entail research development, get the, the willing participants just to come in their numbers so that you really have an impactful uh, sort of like delivery of a program. And uh, I always have ascribed it to 
what we battle with and we continue to battle with and we are winning in some sectors. The whole issue of developing a research culture. Because I believe that these type of uh, programs are much more about enhancing also the research culture in our departments, schools and faculties. And um, the other issue that I wanted to reflect on before I give our, our reflections is um, the whole issue of what an imaging researcher is. As we sit here, and as I listen to a lot of uh, speakers since this morning, I could tell that we, we, we really have an understanding of what an imaging researcher is. When you looked at the presentations earlier on, especially from the NRF and all that, the funds that are made available for imaging researcher development, you can be able to see the onset of what we call imaging researcher and perhaps also what we expect to come out after a particular intervention. But you find that when you go to the realities of our institutions, and I'm speaking from the background of where I come from, you'll find that there's a mismatch between what is believed to be an imaging researcher with what we have and what we ought to have. Where you find that at some stage you have to, you are forced to say, a person with a PhD, five years of involvement in research, teaching and community engagement, still is within what you call imaging research. So the participants will vary based on that realization. So we then put together a team of people who might have been about to complete their PhD, have just completed their PhD, but others would have completed their PhDs five or more years ago was a group uh, we had targeted to have 30 participants in our institution. SARS program was a, a webinar form of a, a project where on scheduled dates, we were supposed to be linked in one platform with all other institutions, I think, across Africa in most uh, of the countries. And I think a few other countries from Asia, if I'm not mistaken, other parts of the world, which was an interesting one because one of the good things that you have a pool of researchers that you put in one room that are going to go through a course. For example, a topic would be on how you uh, develop your own research focus or a research agenda or a niche area that one would want to follow for the next uh, few years of their research life. And then you then find that uh, there's an opportunity to network with other people because as you are logged in and you are part of the, of the project, you then are able to see other people out there who are, who are within your area of interest and who are interested, asking similar questions to what you have and all that. And I think my cohort was excited about that. And I think the first session, everyone was assisted by our ICT, how to connect and all that. And those who preferred to connect from their com the comfort of their offices, they did so. I think a few of them were sitting in one room and they followed the webinar. But after that, uh, we had a meeting because after the, each session, then there will be scheduled discussions to discuss the topics that came from the webinar and to do some tasks that were all, uh, allocated during the webinar. Then the feeling was, no, it would be better for all of us to be in one room. So we'd arrange for that room and we then took up a small computer lab where everyone would log in in that and would have <coughs> some audio uh, output that uh, was able to follow the, the voice that comes from the other side and that, sparked a very interesting group that had a lot of debates, a lot of uh, discussions, and very interesting uh, outcomes. Of course, we targeted 30, as I said. I think we ended up with a static group of about 24. At the end of that, um, 
project, I, I remember very well because once they finished the whole program, we then set up a small celebration lunch to say we have gone through this and let's celebrate that we have been at it until the end. I think we had about 15 people who have gone through all uh, webinars. Now, another thing I wanted to reflect on is what the program covered, the scope of what it meant in according to the STARS program, of what it means to, to, to develop early career researchers. And, and for me, that was most interesting because for having to consider myself as also as an imaging research development manager, and working with this group who are noted as research develop, uh, imaging research, uh, uh, early career researchers, what was a very interesting one in the sense that part and parcel of being with them, and I think the previous speaker has just uh, alluded to being engaged and being part of the program yourself. Uh, as they discover what it means to be a researcher, I was also partly discovering what it means to develop early career researchers. So that was for me very interesting. So understanding the scope of what I need to do within the terrain of uh, research development, but also for them understanding the whole package of what a researcher is supposed to be. And um, the, 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 thank you very much. The, 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 I already alluded to the fact that our researchers were a mix of people with various qualifications, those that in other instances would have been expected to be already developed or established researchers. First encounter with some colleagues from international countries, some of them would uh, confirm that they had no idea that it's really necessary for them to start exposing their research interest and their research work to national, even and international uh, stages. And for us, that, that was a change. We then had, in my observation, a number of them that started to come now to the research office to say we need support in this and this and that. And we still have a, la a large number of them that say to us, help me to get funding so that I can be able to establish myself and be able to uh, cover these aspects of my research life that were, were, not, were not covered. I'm left with uh, two minutes or less. So let me say what has been happening currently is that some of the lessons we learned from the stars, we applied them in shaping, for example, our university capacity development program in the university, especially within research development. We have established, for example, through the UCDP, a cohort of staff, junior staff, that are now this year in their second year of PhD study. And uh, um, among other things, we were taking them through workshops of a simil similar nature because we have the material at our disposal and from time to time we tap on it. And we select, for example, other uh, facilitators that would come and cover topics that are similar to what is happening. But also, as a university, we have now realized the need for us to sort of like improve and increase on our postdoctoral fellowships in the university. And we believe that this type of a project can be something that can be able to assist us in enhancing the capacity of our supervisors, the capacity of our researchers, and in particular, it could be a project that we could take our uh, postdoctoral fellows through in order for them to be able to achieve their goals. So in a nutshell, that's briefly what I can reflect. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
So I'm very mindful that we have 10 minutes before the next session starts, and it's our last session, so I'm going to have a radical suggestion, which is that since the next session is a discussion, a group discussion facilitated from the uh, sessions we've had so far, you keep your questions for these speakers, and we have them as the, maybe the start of the next session at 3.30, and we take a 10-minute break now. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah? Great, okay, thank you very much. And thank, please could you join me in thanking our speakers for such a really excellent and quite inspiring set of presentations. Thank you.